solutions to specific climate challenges. Um, so, for example, we'll work with our research partners and ask them, what are you, what are you working on right now? And where do you need information that you don't have to answer your questions? Um, an example of an answer we got a couple of years ago from one of our great research partners out in California was um, they're looking at the seams of smart grid and smart homes in areas that have a higher adoption rate of solar. Um, they're seeing with modern smart grid technology, things like sub-second voltage spikes on the grid. They're right. seeing poor power factor, power quality. Um, and of course, solar, you know, with cloud cover changes instantaneously on production. Um, so we're trying to understand what's really driving a lot of the things we're seeing on the grid. Well, that picture is incomplete unless you have similar data from other types of buildings that are on that grid. Um, and then from there, you can start to piece together, well, what's causing your problem? And then you can understand how to solve it. So we went into California. We instrumented about 100 homes with sensors that give us the same time granularity of data as they get off the grid. So one second interval direct measurements on those households, mm -hmm. all about how they're using energy, but also about their solar production. And then that let those researchers really piece together that picture. Um, and then we also close information gaps around technology and solutions and how well those work in the field. So we just try to really accelerate that cycle of innovation through the whole chain of initial advanced research into getting products into the marketplace and getting consumer feedback on their experience and impact on the water. Yeah, yeah, that's what we do. It's a, it's a, live, <laughs> it's a live laboratory, right? I mean, I, in doing the re I think I saw a billion data points a day that you collect from the uh, homes that you have on in the, involved in the participants in the activity, and then upwards, I believe, of 2,000 universities that are participating or have participated in different types of research. I mean, it's just a unique way of, of approaching innovation, and it's been extremely successful. I remember when it first started off, we were talking about it beforehand 10 plus years ago, and to see where it is today is, is really exciting. Uh, your background as well. I mean, you've been involved in the space and you've done a lot of interesting things prior to even becoming coming to Pecan Street. Maybe just tell us a little bit about what you've done and, and more specifically kind of how you got connected into the energy industry. Sure. Um, that's always a fun question to answer. My background is really in um, community sustainable development, which can mean a bunch of different things. Um, but my passion is for working with communities to understand what do the people that live there want in their life? What will make their lives easier, better? And how can we create communities that better serve the people that live there while also making our natural environment that we all rely on more resilient um, and healthier? And uh, so I've worked around the world in different countries on that topic. And I, prior to coming to the country, worked for Mayor Bloomberg in New York City, yep. helping to design and implement green building policies for affordable housing. Um, I'm a native Austinite, so I always try to okay. keep my finger on what, what's happening here. And this Pecan Street initiative was kind of getting started um, when I was thinking about coming back home. And it was such a fascinating process. It was this huge stakeholder group that came together to talk about how can we take advantage of everything that's great about Austin to really figure out what do we mean by a smart grid and how does that help our community? Um, and so I was able to join the team really early on. And it's just this okay. fascinating community informed technology development process that I think really is unique, but we continue to hope will be replicated around the world. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, it's just a good story and, and it's exciting to see what you've been able to do there as well during the tenure you've been there and what's gone, what's on the roadmap going forward. I, I just think there's so many exciting things going on in this space today from a technology perspective, obviously clean energy, the, the things that we're looking at broadly across the globe from a impacting sustainability. What would you give somebody who, who's looking to start a career in the space? What advice would you give them today as coming into the space, given what you've been through? Yeah, um, it's probably a boring answer, but I think we're at just a point generally in our society where everything is about data now. And so I would say engage in that space, start to understand what do we mean by smart data, what kind of information um, is needed for the types of problems that you want to solve, um, and really just dive into how can you how can you use modern technology and leverage existing kind of data platforms that are out there now pretty much in every household in the world right. um, to drive innovation? And I think we're seeing it, right? I mean, we're seeing it in our space, technology and, and skill sets that we've seen across other industries now are becoming equally important um, in the energy and water space. So that's great advice. 
for anybody looking to do something in our in our industry. That's great. Well, let's dive into a couple of the questions. Um, let's start with technology, um, since we ended with that. So what technology innovations or policy shifts do you see coming down the road that are going to change or, or impact the utility business model? Yeah, um, I think there are a few, and this is a really good question. Um, you know, data obviously is probably the top one um, because we will have a shift towards electrification. We are undergoing a transformation in the electricity sector to be powered by clean energy, mostly renewables. Um, all of that means de facto that our energy system is becoming decentralized. Um, so that's, I would say, not a surprise to utilities. Right. That's something that's coming down the pike. It's happening now. Um, but what is coming down the pike are the data solutions that are required to really manage that transition and to do so in a way where we can have an efficient and a reliable grid. So we're not just overbuilding and overinvesting in massive utility scale solar or wind power plants paired with massive battery systems, but we're really able to use existing data platforms and artificial intelligence to design and manage smart systems that can do real-time load balancing between buildings, that can integrate buildings with the grid, um, that we can make this transition happen in a way that's quick and affordable and reliable, which all of us down here in Texas are really care about right now. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, one of my thoughts is, so we always, the business model content has always, or priority has always been out there for a while. Obviously the shift around it has been something that has continued to change. Um, in terms of what does it mean, right? What does that new business model start to look like? But what about the speed of it, right? I mean, I agree. I mean, I think you're starting to see that distributed energy piece beginning to be more prominent, especially as more renewables come out in the marketplace. And we've got a few questions around that as well. But how do you see that speed of change starting to take place? Because quick could be is is in the mind of the beholder, right? In terms of what that might look like in our industry versus what you might see in others. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the electric utility industry is famous for being slow to change. Uh, but I think that the Biden administration federal policies um, and the incentives that are coming into place are going to create a lot of transformation in the next few years. You know, I think where we've seen um, fits and starts over really the past two to three decades, we're just going to see that transformation begin to happen in a way that's irreversible over the next two years. And then I think we're probably looking five to 10 years down the line at complete at a complete change. It, the majority of our power will come from renewable resources and the majority of our power will be electric. Yeah, and that's gonna drive it obviously, right? Those, those changes on the generation side along with the technology that we've talked about and the ability to integrate that in in a way that's going to help manage those is going to basically is going to force the change right it's going to drive that change from my perspective as well well that's a good transition uh to the next question you know talking about uh the biden administration and, and the, the plan they have in place because there's a lot of discussion going on around in the space right now around that plan and what the impact that may have on the clean energy innovation as well as just addressing climate change overall Pecan Street, you guys have done a lot of work in that area. You've been focusing on clean energy technologies. We talked about you've been a leader in the vehicle, the grid, VDG activity. So what are your thoughts on, on the proposal from the administration and, and how do you see that impacting grid monetization and the utility overall? Yeah, we're very excited about it. Uh, you know, it's that scale of funding that's needed to modernize our grid. You know, whether we're modernizing to decarbonize um, or not, our grid needs to be modernized, right? All of the infrastructure sure. needs to be updated. Um, and that funding is critical so that it's not just, I think, going to be rolled out in an otherwise inequitable way based on local revenue and ratepayer capabilities to fund that work. So overall, we're really pleased to see that such an aggressive infrastructure plan is being proposed and that a significant amount of that is earmarked for um, grid modernization, but also electric transportation infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, because it's the regional connectivity that we think has really slowed down the adoption of EVs. It's the ability to leave your neighborhood <laughs> without having right. to worry about it. Right. Um, that's the critical piece here. More and more EVs are coming into the marketplace, more choice, more affordability, but we need that kind of highway supercharging infrastructure. Um, so we hope that the Biden administration really focuses on that versus more kind of level two home retail charging rollout. 
Um, it's that super, super highway charging infrastructure that's needed. Um, but we also really appreciate that the Biden administration's taking a more modern view to infrastructure and including that invisible infrastructure in their plan. Um, because again, just data, the ability for utilities to get large amounts of data, to manage that in real time, um, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes along with that, even though the data is not seen, you know, it's not seen as a customer service, you don't turn on a switch and see data, right? Right, um, exactly. But that, but it's really critical to being able to turn on a switch and get affordable power um, that's not polluting your neighbors. So we're, we're really excited about those two components in particular. Well, I'm just, in terms of the work you guys are doing, I mean, when you think about some of the activities that happen in Texas, right, and climate change, and, and weather patterns starting to impact different parts of the country, at least in the US in ways maybe not seen before or in ways that are more um, consistent, right? Versus things that might've happened every 30, 40 years or seeing it more frequently. What do you think that needs to, what are some of the things from the work you're doing that can help facilitate kind of the improvement of the grid, the modernization of the grid to address those changing climate conditions, much like we saw in Texas, right? Earlier in the year. Yeah, um, th I think this brings in a really critical element of how we approach this transition in the energy sector um, of thinking about racial justice that has to be a part of all of our planning and our thought processes now. Um, and we saw that a lot with the, the, the storm that we had here yeah. that knocked out most of Texas power grid. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation put out a report this week that showed using satellite imagery of nighttime lights that um, households in census block groups that were um, where the census block is pre pre predominantly a minority households mm -hmm. were four times as likely to suffer blackouts during those periods. Um, which as a reminder for anybody not in Texas, we were all freezing during that week. So that's a huge humanitarian crisis that we're all still reeling from. And the fact that if you live in an area that's predominantly Hispanic or black, you were 400% more likely to be dealing with the blackout in those freezing temperatures um, is unacceptable, but it also helps to answer the question of, is race really something that we need to talk about when we talk about our grid and we talk about clean energy? Um, it absolutely is. I, I couldn't agree more. No, it's an it's an important point that I know we're going to touch on a little bit here as we as we go through the conversation. You mentioned on the same topic as we talk about the infrastructure plan. You've talked about distributed energy. You know the the need the technology needed to help facilitate that, right? I mean, I, I think it's it feels like from my perspective, just looking at the space, there's a need for kind of a framework kind of broadly that can cross over all the different areas within the country, all the different um, electricity grids, to be able to think about how we're gonna just leverage the renewables that are coming in and look at it again, kind of the balance between a generation focus that becomes more distributed at the business and the home level, in addition to what we've seen historically as something that's more plant driven. So how do you kind of see that technology starting to play a role in that? We talked a little bit about timing, you know, that becomes an important part of really leveraging these dollars, right? I think from a from a infrastructure plan to get the most of it and to make sure it's it's long term and not short term. Yeah, uh, I love this question. Um, and yeah, we agree. There needs to be a lot more standardization when we think about these technologies. Um, and kind of this knitting together of the seams again of smart building right. and smart grids. Um, one of the metaphors we've been using lately around the office is, you know, imagine that we all had these ama amazing streaming services that we have now on our TVs, you know, uh, 5G streaming capacity. That's probably not the right term. I actually don't know a whole lot about technology, believe it or not. Um, but, you know, you have these incredible content providers, these amazing opportunities in your household, but your internet service is still dial up. So you can't really take advantage of it. That's really exactly. where we're at in the energy sector. We have these incredible smart home technologies, electric vehicles, vehicle to grid capabilities, energy storage systems that are so sophisticated, it can make your computer look like you know something from the 80s. Um, but there's no way to actually provide a lot of that benefit back to the grid, which by the way, benefits all of us, particularly exactly households that can't afford their own energy storage system so that they can power their household in a freeze or a, a brownout. Um, so it really is, I think, 
a lot on the utility side at this point to think about how do they get sophisticated and how do they get ready for the age of data, the age of yeah. big data. Um, that's just going to have to happen in order for all of these technologies to really roll out in a cost-effective way that benefits everybody. Yep, I couldn't agree more. And that actually leads to the next question a little bit that we talked a little bit earlier about vehicle to grid activity and what we've seen you know, in the industry for a while. And, and we've talked about that for a while as well, right? Along with electric vehicle rollouts that we're starting to see more, um, definitely at higher levels, more activity from the industry, the car industry to make manufacture more vehicles are gonna be electric only. So when you think about the vehicle, the grid technology, you know, where do you see that at the moment and what's it going to take to push that to the next level to make it, back to your earlier comment, to make it a reality versus still maybe a pilot project? Yeah, um, we put a paper out a couple of weeks ago trying to, to tackle some of that uh, because we're really bullish on V2G. We, as you mentioned before, this is an area of research we've been deep into for about five yeah. years now. Um, and we've done a lot of research to show the potential for V2G for utility benefit to reduce critical peak power, make power more affordable for everybody. If the utilities start leveraging this technology to feed power back onto the grid during peak times, just a number of different applications that really can help make our grids more affordable and reliable. And yet um, the, techno the V2G technology itself, that charging system is still incredibly expensive. There's not a lot of companies in that space for the residential sector. And there's also virtually no utility programs that would even let a household feed power back on, much less utilities being proactive about how to leverage that technology. Um, so one of the things that we're able to do with the kind of the Pecan Street Living Laboratory model, as you described it earlier, is um, we are able to look across these thousand households that we've got monitored across the country and identify trends that are coming into place in communities. And one thing we've seen over the past year is a lot more households with electric vehicles are getting high capacity home charging systems. So instead of a level two charging system that would take maybe six hours to charge up their car, they're getting high capacity ones where they can charge in a couple of hours, which means right. if you come home and you plug in at 5 p.m., that whole charging block is happening during peak time rather than being spread out across a number of hours. So that can make um, serving that load a lot more expensive for utilities um, to the tune of about 23% more expensive. Um, but we modeled out some different scenarios, again, using our data, uh, where we looked at if you had smart charging capabilities to even just do something as common as demand response on those vehicles, you could actually reduce that the cost to serve those vehicles by almost 20% from what it costs utility today with normal level two charging, because that shorter that shorter, faster charge becomes a really dynamic, really effective load to shift around to serve utility needs. And that's just shifting the load. I mean, imagine then when you can shoot all that power back onto the grid when you need it. Um, yep. Even having that capability during our storm when voltage across the grid started to tank, which is what almost shut down our entire grid, being able to call on a bunch of vehicles with that kind of charge capability to just shoot an influx of power onto the grid to help stabilize it. I mean, the potential is enormous. And what's holding it back really is that um, we haven't seen utilities get to a mindset where they are willing to accept that these technologies are critical and to put into place these data management systems. And quite frankly, the staff who understands data uh, to be able to utilize them, to be able to integrate that into how they think about energy management. Um, yeah. So I, that yeah. so, and if utilities did that, the markets would come, right? Innovators would get into the space. We'd have affordable chargers that become available in the next few years. That's what we think is holding it back. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can kind of see if you look at technology iterations in our industry, right? Some kind of sometimes version one, very much early stage. You know, trying to just test out conceptually maybe how something could work, getting other groups a part of it. It's sometimes it feels like if I use electric vehicles as a guide or even the charging station concept is part of that as well. If you go back a couple of iterations, as improved technology comes about, you start seeing better price points, easier interoperability across the different components that need to connect, be connected to make it work in our case, right? In our space, right? There's multiple things that need to happen in order to make it work seamlessly. So I, I think that seems to be what is next for the V to G piece is that some of the technology has been there. It's getting to that next level to be able to come up with an approach that makes it maybe more economical, that makes it also easier, both 
for the utility and the consumer to integrate it into their um, electric household, right? I mean, that's really what you wanted to have. And then I think the other piece that I'm interested in, I, I've kind of been promoting this partnerships, right? As we start to move through this phase of moving towards approaching decarbonization goals, right? At a regional state or broader level, you know, it's, it's not just one entity or set of stakeholders that have to be a part of it. You, you need us as consumers, right? Whether we're businesses or individuals to be a part of it and to be engaged in that. Now we don't have to be, we shouldn't have to be experts in electricity, right? And grid management, but we need to be engaged in knowing that those are some of the things as we bring an electric vehicle into our home, as we bring high power charging into the home, as we may have solar panels, how do those things fit into my electric environment in my household, in my neighborhood and in my utility environment? And how do I help? Right, and make that two-way street part of the conversation. So not it's not a technology play per se, it's a little bit of both. And I think that part, that's the customer side of it, right? There's the technology side, but then there's the customer side. And yeah. as an industry, we have to figure out how to bring all those pieces together. Because I think when we do that, that's going to help drive some of the things that you just described, right? Is what may be holding us back. What are some of the next steps that we need to happen? And it's it's kind of bringing all, in my opinion, it's kind of bringing all those pieces together. I'm not sure if you feel the same way or not, but that is something I think that can help the conversation. Yeah, I completely agree. I think you're touching on this need for systems thinking, which is why we need our utilities to start to take leadership in this space. Is thinking because you've got the companies building products and they want to sell their product to you. Um, but we need systems thinking, and that has to come from our utility about how do all these products fit together? How do they integrate with the grid? How do we help every customer have reliable, affordable power? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I, I just, and I think with some of the bigger push coming forward with the infrastructure proposal, right, from the Biden administration. And then just the general activity from the decarbonization goals that are happening both at state levels, at company levels, we have a great, we have momentum in the industry to start to figure out how to put those pieces together like we've not seen before. And I think that's part of the opportunity as well, right, to yeah. be able to put those pieces. Well, that yeah. leads us to our last, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. One oh, more, well, I was just going to ask you a question. You know, I'm curious if you've seen that sort of multi-stakeholder process for this kind of big issue play out anywhere else. Are there models that you think electric utilities can be looking at right now? So every little step of this isn't being created. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm from the Northwest, and, and so that's my background, and I worked at one of the utilities out here as well, and I think that region of the country has had various stakeholder groups that come from both utilities, uh, industry experts, uh, groups that are associations that are focused on certain components of conservation, energy efficiency, renewables that do come together to work. And I always say that applies to other parts of the country as well. That to me is probably, you know, examples of what has worked in other types of areas that we should leverage and try to do the same thing here as well. Mm -hmm. It might be some different groups, as we've talked about, that need to be engaged in those discussions, maybe not industry only, uh, especially when you start bringing in some of the other areas around equity and clean energy, racial justice. There's other stakeholder groups that need to be a part of that. But I think that becomes part of the um, area that we can focus in on and leverage some of the successes in the past on similar types of approaches and use that as the building block to help drive these types of discussions. And, and learn from what's worked elsewhere and build upon that, not just in our space, but in other industries as well, that it may be addressing similar issues um, that are, 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 are having to be looked at in the same way. Yeah, and I'm curious about, um, you know, in California, for example, the California PUC, the regulator, tends to be the convener, I think, of a lot of those multi-stakeholder working groups. Um, and in an environment such as Texas, uh, where your regulator is not going to convene a big multi-stakeholder group to talk about how do we accelerate the transition to clean energy, right. um, how do we solve racial justice in the energy sector, um, one of the things that we're going to be working out on Pecan Street over the next year is really trying to identify and build models for how this change takes place when your regulators aren't willing to be the leaders, aren't willing to be the conveners. Because otherwise, it's just cognitive overload for the, I think, utility management and everybody else to be figuring out how do you solve all of these problems that you are not an expert in. Yeah, I mean, it definitely takes a variety of folks, without a doubt. And I think, you know, we'll have to be 
um, leverage things that have worked beforehand, but also not maybe rely on the past of, of what's been maybe drivers of those initiatives historically and look for different ways to get that message out and to help build that process in a way that's going to address the things that are in front of us around climate change, sustainability, uh, and, and the activities that are coming around that. And yeah, I think you're seeing it from a state level and from a regional level, but how to bring some of those pieces together so there's a broader framework that we can collectively use to help support it. Ho hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll see how some of that plays out, but I think that's some of the opportunity in front of us, given what we have in terms of uh, the ability to kind of extend and accelerate some of these areas on the, on the renewable side. Right, and on the on the on the energy side as well. well. Well, that leads us to our last question, which is a rather large, broad one, but I'll be curious on your insights around it. So, what do you think utilities aren't thinking about right now that they should be thinking about? Yeah, I think it's uh, the pretty much the themes we've touched on already. Um, you know, really getting serious about big data and artificial intelligence, and asking, do we have the right assets? Do we have the right staff? Um, are we really prepared? Do we have the right cybersecurity and privacy policies? Do we have the right people to create those policies uh, for this big data energy management future? Um, and I think right now the answer to most of those questions is no, not yet, but hopefully we'll get there. Hopefully some of the Biden infrastructure planning will help support building out those capabilities within the utilities that have to be the ones to manage this transition. Um, and I also think really getting serious about energy generation energy uh, is something that a lot of utilities aren't prepared for. I think uh, in many circles, the topic of race and racial justice is viewed as kind of this hot, trendy topic of the moment, um, rather than a really entrenched issue that has got to be solved. Um, and we think that that's an entrenched issue that has to be solved within the energy sector. Uh, and so we, I think I mentioned we put out a you know paper yeah. on race and energy this past week that really just serves um, to kind of put a flag in the ground to put some numbers behind what does that intersection look like between race and energy? What are we even talking about? Um, you know, one of the one of the outcomes that's not our research; it's research that we quoted from one of our great partners, uh, Dr. Diana Hernandez, I believe, put out this paper, but. The researcher found that when you normalize for income, black households are about 69% less likely than their white counterparts to have rooftop solar. And Hispanic households are almost 40% less likely to have rooftop solar. So we're talking about how do we make solar prevalent? How do we make electric vehicles prevalent across our society? Well, we have these huge gaps in access or an opportunity. We've got to figure out why. Um, and so we think really starting to get serious about understanding the problems there um, and developing solutions that are racially, that have racial equitability as an outcome for the energy transition are critical and, and not being taken very seriously right now in a lot of circles. Well, besides the paper too, right? You, you launched the Center for Race, Energy and Climate Justice as well, right? So I realized some of the activities with the paper and other things are falling underneath that particular um, area now of the business that is becoming higher profile, right, as, as we talked about earlier, which is great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And the point of that center is um, actually to do some something that you were mentioning earlier that's really important. It's to bring together these technical kind of energy experts um, with experts in consumer research and human behavior and environmental justice advocates so we can really build on other sectors that have looked seriously at race um, and try to solve for racial equitability. Um, not start yet another major initiative in the energy sector from scratch, but let's get smart and look at what have other sectors done? How can we apply those models here? Um, and then hopefully really start to develop and demonstrate some solutions over the next year. Yeah, and I think as you and I were talking about earlier, I think finally this topic is getting a voice in the industry, right? It's not that people haven't been focused on it in different ways, but it's been probably in smaller pockets. And now I think with some of the activity that we're seeing again with the emphasis on climate change, the emphasis on building out infrastructure to support that, people are now taking, there's a greater look around how to make sure it's available to everyone everywhere. And that's really important. It's not an easy answer. It's not, it's a complex um, set of issues that have to be dealt with, but I think this is a perfect time to deal with it. And I think we're seeing 
more organizations like yourself developing um, centers, developing research, helping build out frameworks, and really helping drive the discussion um, and really hitting home on areas that need to be addressed and thought through to truly make it equitable um, as we think about spending the next set of dollars to grow and build out something that's extremely important for all of us, but it needs to be available for all of us. And, and I think what you guys are doing obviously is extremely important that helps have that discussion and make that discussion front and center. So, uh, you know, more of that, just keep pushing that forward, which is great. Well, this has been fantastic, uh, Suzanne. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your thoughts and insights, both personally in terms of what you guys are doing as well as what you're doing at Pecan Street. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure our audience has as well. And so we uh, hope to have you back. There's, these are big topics, really important uh, across the industry and our front and center. So look forward to having you back to sharing more of the work you guys are doing there. Well, thank you for having me. This was a great discussion. I'm a big fan of yours as well, Darren. And well, thank, thank you, you to the whole C Prime team. Thanks so much. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laurel. And uh, for those who are on, so you can stay on, there's gonna be a, a session followed up with Laurel on takeaways from today's discussion. So uh, enjoy and thank you guys very much. Thanks, bye.